Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our first topic is Broadcom. For those of you who have not been paying attention, uh, they do custom silicon, build custom silicon for companies like Google and Meta. And they also have a market cap uh, that before this week was around $840 billion. And after this week, it's uh, called up 20%-ish. Uh, big quarter, uh, not a big quarter, a, a good quarter, not a great quarter. They had uh, their key revenue segment was AI revenue. That's the language that they use, AI revenue. It essentially was $3.7 in the quarter. That compares the expectations of 3.5, so it just kind of nudged above the expectation. But more importantly, they stuck their neck way out and talked about a calendar 27 number. And uh, this gets to the A topic and becomes the A topic because it speaks to what the sustainability of the AI infrastructure spend is going to look like. And of course, the reason why NVIDIA trades at a high 20s multiple is that the expectations are in calendar 26, that they're going to grow at 21%. So this big deceleration from the 100% growth that they're going to experience basically in the January quarter. So we have this uh, narrative around when is AI infrastructure going to hit the wall? And then you pull in the Broadcom guidance, and it basically suggests that their play, their piece of this, the custom silicon piece, uh, which is different than NVIDIA, but the custom silicon piece is going to grow at around 60% per year for the next three years, well above that 21% expectation for, 20, for NVIDIA. And so when I... Uh, put all this together, my sense was higher for longer on AI infrastructure. I think that's probably right. And we were talking about this earlier. I mean, I think if you look at 2025 and into 2026, I think the theme of the year, when we get to the end of the year, so it's going to take a little time to build, but the theme of the year will ultimately be that the hyperscalers are spending more and more on their own custom silicon. I think Broadcom's earnings last night was kind of the first real touch point of that. But if you if you think about what that means and then ultimately what has to happen for that to translate into the market, you know, people have to start to understand the benefits and the value of custom silicon. Obviously the broader market understands the value of NVIDIA chips as these general purpose, the best general purpose computers for doing uh, AI. Over time though, I think let's the jump, narrative let's jump in a little bit. Give a one on one on shift. Why don't we give a one-on-one -on, -one on uh custom silicon versus the GPU? The the basis level that you can think about it is a GPU. What NVIDIA makes is a uh a chip that is a general purpose accelerator, meaning that you can use it for a lot of different workloads. It doesn't necessarily have to be just AI. It's something where you're doing a lot of computation simultaneously. Um, you know, versus a CPU, which does a little bit uh, things more, you know, serially, right? And so um, that's that's what NVIDIA has sort of been great at is this general purpose acceleration um, in compute where they can handle all different types of workloads. What custom silicon does is it's a little bit more like you can think of it as Apple in a way. What they've always done, kind of marrying hardware and software. When one of these hyperscalers builds their own custom silicon, they actually can tune the hardware to work uh, more effectively, more efficiently with the software that they're building because they know what software they're writing. They know what the software they ultimately what they want it to do. And so they can kind of build some of that use case right into the chip itself, which drives more efficiency and ultimately cost savings. So it's just that it's customized. And uh, so... That's what uh, we talk about this kind of the bid now or the increase in demand and the guidance that uh, Broadcom gave, gave included their current customers. And they hinted that there are other customers out there. Apple and OpenAI are, are the ones that they're most likely talking about that would be in addition to that 60% uh, growth that I had outlined. And so is that kind of, if we bring all this together, let's even go a higher level between custom versus the, the GPU is it safe to say that we're probably going to have higher for longer in terms of growth rate for the broader AI infrastructure companies? Or is it going to be more specific where, you know, they're going to have some winners like Broadcom and the custom silicon, but maybe some lo losers like AMD? I think you'll probably see a little bit more bifurcation. I think in the near term, 
I think the the arms race is still absolutely on. So I don't know that you're going to see over the right. next quarter, two quarters, maybe even three quarters, um, that there is much of a generalized slowdown, right, or or any particular point slowdown. I do think, though, as you as you get into the year again, getting toward 26 and then into 26, I do think you're going to see a lot more investment in custom silicon and an actual deployment of custom silicon, and that may change kind of how the broader hardware market looks. Um, at that point, I think that that could be what the catalyst is. Let's jump to our second topic, which is Apple releases in the U.S. Uh, intelligent uh, Apple intelligence. Uh, I think kind of I'd say the substance of it. This, of course, they had said they expect it by the end of the year. When they say that, usually they get it like one or two days before. In this case, a couple weeks before. Neither here nor there, but it's out. Uh, I have a phone that can run it and also run. Uh, the iPhone 16, which can run the, the visual side. And I just want to quickly recap what's happened is essentially they have brought GPT into this. So you can set it as your default. So when you push uh, one of the side buttons and you ask a question, it uses GPT much more useful than uh, using uh, Siri, essentially. Um, second is this Genmoji where you can create just kind of silly uh, emojis. Uh, they have Apple, they have uh, uh, this visual piece where it's similar to Astra from what Google has shown, where you can kind of look at the world around you and, and take it in. And all of three days into this, and I would say from my experience is that uh, this is the first time where I'm seeing like getting more excited about what's what's happening. And um, have you tried it, Doug? I mean, we haven't even caught up on this. I, I don't know even what version you're on. Is it something you've played around with? I've tried it. Yep. Uh, so what, what's your take on the initial kind of those three cornerstone features? Uh, again, I think I go back to kind of as expected in my view, based on some of the reports that were out there, based on what we saw from Apple. And for me, for a person who doesn't use, uh, or sorry, who uses AI a lot, I use a lot of different tools. It's sort of a, you know, shoulder shrug, uh, because this is sort of things I'm already doing for, Maybe the more average Apple user who's not using AI as much as me, right. I think it could be a little bit cooler. I don't know that it's a, you know, oh my God, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen kind of a moment to be fair about you know, what probably the average user is experiencing. But, you know, I think it's probably good for that user, but not going to uh, really show the true power and potential of AI yet. I think we need to see more features for that. Would agree. And, you know, I love putting numbers on things here and, Kind of going into this, if you'd have asked me back in September what my reaction to this update would have been when it was out, I would have said on a scale of one to 10, 10 being uh, off the charts, great. I would have said expected to be an eight or a nine. I think it's probably a seven. It's something that uh, it's nice. There are features that I will use. I think that it will spur some upgrades, undoubtedly. But I think that the product continues to need to get filled out. And there's still some clumsiness in terms of how you turn on different features and how you use them. Uh, so it's, we're just, uh, again, this is in the category of scratching the surface. And I still think uh, calendar 25 uh, is going to be upside to iPhone for next year, but the real upside still kind of sets up for 26. Fun fact is that in the month of October, street expectations for iPhone growth in this upcoming cycle here, so for, for fiscal 25, came down from 5% down to 3%. And uh, I think that that speaks to some concerns about whether uh, uh, Apple intelligence would actually be a catalyst. Uh, since uh, the over the past month, shares of Apple are up 11%, the Nasdaq's up 4%, which I think speaks to, even though the, the street numbers have come down, uh, investors are now kind of thinking that there's probably some upside to those iPhone numbers. They should do that. Uh, they just did iPhone just grew at 5% in the uh, September quarter, I think a 3% number off of a big base that's coming for upgrades should be pretty easy. So I kind of, when you put this, uh, uh, kind of mix all this stew together, I think what it comes out to is Apple's getting the joke around AI. They're also making more announcements related to hardware. We talked about the Broadcom. They were uh, last week at Amazon's AWS event and talked about working with their Trainium chip, which is more signs that Apple wants to do, kind of take some of their own AI destiny back into their hands. And so I think uh, making the right moves, but still haven't hit that nirvana moment. We're going to jump to the next topic, which is related to uh, Google, showing some flex in terms of Gemini uh, coming out with 2.0. 
Yeah, 2.0 is is uh, the newest and latest and greatest frontier model that we have to play with now. I think it was a huge step forward for Gemini. Um, I don't know that the the average person or the AI connoisseur would say that it puts them clearly ahead of GPT, but it certainly was a really good upgrade. And I think there's two major things to take away from it. One so, yeah, what was the what was the big step forward in the uh, substance? Yeah, these are the two things, Gemini 2.0, right, versus Gemini 1.5 Pro, which is their former top line model. So Flash is the version that they put out for 2.0, which is generally their uh, smaller model, right? It runs more efficiently. It's not fully featured like the Pro version, but the new Flash version of Gemini beat the old Pro version of Gemini. So as a starting point, Right, we have more efficiency and ultimately better cost. That's the first takeaway. Um, and it's just flat out better. The model is flat out better than 1.5 Pro. What we've seen in terms Which, of features so what is, that what were added were there's, there's greater. Yeah. Say that again. What, what do you mean when you just say it's flat out better? I think you're getting to it. Features that. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to get into is some of the features, right? We've got multimodal, I think really true multimodal where the model, the new model is able to process things like video images with much more detail and much more impressive results just uh, anecdotally. And I think, you know, you can look at the benchmarks too. The benchmarks are better as well, but you can throw a video into Gemini 2.0. You can throw uh, a vi uh, an image into Gemini 2.0 and get very accurate responses asking, you know, what's happening in uh, this content. Uh, whereas that's not something really that you could do in 1.5 Pro. So you're seeing the feature set evolve more. And I think that that sets Gemini 2.0 up for this next world of agentic AI that we've all been talking about for agents to work. They need to not just be able to understand text. They need to be able to understand images. They need to be able to understand videos. And so we're taking a step forward in that front too. Makes a ton of sense when you kind of put, do your, uh, can you, uh, amuse me and do a forced ranking of how you think the top five models are, are stacked right now? I think it's, uh, GPT is probably still number one. I'm sure there's a lot of debate about that, but I think Oh one with sort of the timescale inferencing, you know, that, that feels like there's still probably is, by the, the way, best, is, two, uh, is Google two O doing the timescale inferencing? I don't believe it is. I don't think I saw that as a feature in the release so far. Maybe that's something that they'll end up adding into Pro. Right. Um, we'll see. But I, I, if I did, if it is, I missed it. Um, but number two, I would rank probably Gemini 2.0, which is very close to Anthropic's latest, you know, uh, Claude 3.5. So I, I think those are kind of, to me, the clear top three. And then below them, I think Grok has made a ton of progress, but it's probably still, you know, a step behind the the top three. And then I tend to put Llama in a slightly different category. Uh, for me, again, this is just my perception, how I'm using them, the responses I'm getting, and I spend a lot of time using AI. I would put Llama as uh, the least capable model, but being open source, the way that they're different kind angle. of trying to create their cost infrastructure, it's kind of a different use case in my view. So certainly we should compare them, but I actually think it's like, you know, one, two, three, four, and then like five with an asterisk would probably be Llama. Love it. We're just going to do a quick postscript. If you have been following the Google conversation close this week, undoubtedly you saw the $250 billion in market cap that the company added on news that their quantum chip, Willow, that they've been working on for basically a decade had a breakthrough in testing, essentially being able to do a computational benchmark in about five minutes that previously the benchmark was estimated to take essentially infinity, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Uh, so we have this uh, kind of eye-opening experience for Google investors, like maybe they are doing something exciting. I'll just give my quick take here is that uh, nice to see, it doesn't justify 250 billion in my in my estimation. We're probably 10 years away, and don't forget about Waymo. So on behalf of Deep Tech 315, uh, that's Doug. I'm Gene. Bye for now.